Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute here at Brock University. Uh, thanks for joining us today as we bring you the latest and greatest uh, research news uh, from supporters of, uh, of Covey here at, at Brock. This afternoon, I'm pleased to present our speaker, Dr. Sud Pujari, who's our senior scientist in um, virology here at Covey. Sir Sid earned his PhD in plant pathology from Washington State University in 2013, a few years ago now, uh, where his research was focused on biological and molecular aspects of graft transmissible diseases in grapevines. Before joining Covey, Sid completed his MCERT postdoctoral fellowship at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Summerland Research and Development Centre in the Okanagan Valley in uh, British Columbia. His work there focused on understanding the epidemiology of grapevine virus diseases in British Columbia. Here at the Institute, uh, Sid leads the National Grapevine Virus Testing Facility at Covey, and his research is focused on advanced molecular diagnostics and epidemiology of virus diseases. Today, Sid will be speaking on the advancements of detection methods for plant viruses, with emphasis on grapevine's importance in disease management and clean plant programs. So please join me in welcoming Sid to present us. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks for letting everybody know that why I'm losing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> join the club. <laughs> so, uh, the advanced diagnostic, especially on plant viruses. Um, that being said, I know we are living in the image of uh, COVID-19, uh, the virus that is uh, present out there with, with epidem epidemics uh, happening all over the world. Uh, but today we are going to talk only on plant viruses. We are safe because my clients are plants and they don't sneeze and cough. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is the outline of presentation. Uh, a brief history of plant viruses, how they are detected, when they are detected, and uh, what are the advancements have been uh, in the virus detection, and a little bit of focus on grapevine viruses, uh, especially on the diagnostics again, and what are the applications finally of uh, grapevine virus uh, diseases. So when we talk about plant viruses, uh, it takes all the way back to 1892, uh, when a case was presented to a, a Russian scientist, Dmitry Ivanovsky, uh, on a disease that, was, that is causing kind of mosaic uh, kind of symptoms on uh, tobacco leaves. Um, so obviously at that time, not much known about the plant pathogens, uh, where they do have evidence that there, there is a pathogens called bacteria at the time. So what Ivanovsky uh, did it is, uh, he had those uh, filter papers uh, that can, you know, filter the bacteria. Uh, it's a kind of porcelain filter papers at the time, um, which they used to, you know, uh, purify a lot of liquids. Uh, and they, they do know that when they pass through those filter papers, uh, the pathogens of size bacteria would be detained. When he did that experiment, the fluid that comes uh, pass through the filter papers Again, when he inoculated on healthy plants, he thought he, he saw the same symptoms as the, the, the symptoms on, on the field, for example. So that's, that's when it is started uh, that it is, he, he was thinking it's more of a bacteria, but uh, his observations more of a, uh, concluded that it is a small size bacteria uh, and when you compare to the regular size bacteria. But in 1998, uh, a Dutch scientist, uh, Martina Spicering is the one who kind of developed that story into a further in understanding what is a virus. So he called the, a term contagion virum fluidum. That means it's contagious, it is liquid, and it is live. That means, I mean, he, he actually <clears throat> taken those um, studies of uh, Ivanovsky and also proved, uh, go on to say to prove that it is not a bacteria, it is something else. So, and then it took a long time for us to understand what it is 
1931 when Ernest Prusca invented the electron microscope, and then in 1938 or 39, uh, they actually visualized the virus under the electron microscope. And before that, uh, the scientist Stanley uh, crystallized this TM TMB uh, so that we can see the, the morphology of the, the virus. So from there, now in 2019, we have a great review here in uh, Nature uh, Microbiology where we kind of estimated every year we have 60 billion in, in crop losses due to viruses worldwide. <clears throat> so obviously viruses are taking a toll on, you know, crop production system all over the world. So when we look at, at what exactly virus is, and especially in terms of diagnostic perspective, uh, we need to see what it is composed of. So as you can see in the picture here, this is a typical uh, model structure of a tobacco mosaic virus, the one of the first viruses to be discovered. Um, this is the, the genome, the positively coiled structure here. That's the genetic material. It's a positive sense RNA genome. I will come back. What is positive sense and the RNA genomes to that? And then you see the capsid protein units that are surrounded by this positive sense RNA. So it's basically composed of a genetic material that is nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, but not both in a single virus, and proteins. So what options that it gives us is only work with two components, proteins and nucleic acid, if you want to detect a virus in a given sample. So on the, on the left side, you have electron microscopic particles of this same tobacco mosaic virus. Um, under a, a high magnification. So when we really want to go into details and try to understand what is the uh, basis of this virus diagnostics, especially the nucleic acid-based diagnostics, um, it is very important to understand what is the genomic diversity of these viruses are. As I just mentioned, the white plant viruses have either DNA or RNA as a, as a genome, as you can see, in this flow diagram, DNA viruses, again, divided into linear and circular based on the, the genomic uh, composition. Same with the RNA viruses. And then further down, this linear DNA viruses, again, broke down to either they are single standard or double standard. And with the DNA viruses, again, the circular ones, the same thing whether they are single standard circular or double standard circular. The same goes uh, uh, with the RNA viruses where they have single standard RNA as genomes, double standard RNA as genomes, as well as circular single standard RNA viruses. So that gives us so many options here. So they, again, when this single standard RNA viruses, for example, sorry, single standard RNA viruses are there, it again goes down to which sense they are coding from. If you know a little bit of molecular biology, how the DNA structure works, we have uh, a directions uh, of how the, um, the DNA can be read, either five prime, three prime, or for example, RNA, whether it is transcribed directly into the protein or it will reverse transcribe and then back to the uh, translation again to form proteins. So, in other words, for example, if you recall your um, basics in biology, we all studied central dogma theory, where we know that the hierarchy is DNA, which forms the basis for trans transcribes into a RNA and then translate into a protein. So that is the same case as you see RNA viruses, especially when they are linear and they were where they're single standard and they are positive sense. It is just nothing but a messenger RNA, and it directly translates to the protein. And I believe that is one of the reason, uh, along with so many other environmental factors and a few other um, physical factors, the SSRNA positive sense linear viruses are the most abundant in any given crop species. So it is estimated that around more than 60 to 75 percent of the all plant viruses actually belongs to positive sense single standard RNA, RNA as the genomes. 
that may be again because so many reasons whether it is a domestication of a particular crop a pure selection process in the breeding program that gives a pathogen a specific confined environment or a, a vector that is capable of transmitting that viruses have high disease pressure that can um, that can influence the, the virus presence and the virus spread so we'll come back to those those things a little la a little, little later so before going to the next one, I just wanted to emphasize what is the importance of virus diagnostics? Why we want to study this? So as you can see, um, you might have seen so many uh, crops, um, they're not, they don't show symptoms of same patterns or same uh, type, for example. Uh, the tomatoes with the tomato leaf curl virus may be showing a, a curling of the leaves and when you go to the grapes, you might see, especially in the red-fruited grapes at the end of the season, you might see reddening of the leaves. So again, it's a, not the same virus, it's not the same sim symptoms. And some of the plants, uh, some of the viruses, they do cause latent infections, which means that they don't show any symptoms at all. They can be present in the plants for so long time without producing any symptoms, or once they get their favorable conditions, they start to replicate more and increase their virus titer inside the plants, which might trigger the symptom expression. And then the source, where the virus comes from. When you have a specific diagnostic that can particularly detect and characterize a particular virus uh, with the kind of technology that we have in terms of sequence of the particular virus, we can actually trace back to the virus where it is sourced from. We can study the evolution of the relationship using the genomic information. So how do the virus transmit it? The epidemiology of the virus is very, very critical, especially when you are looking at an emerging disease with the virus. Um, it is very important to know how it is spreading, whether it is there is a plant-to-plant -plant transmission or a mechanical transmission or if there is any insect vector that is present, or it is transmitted by pollens, or, or some other um, some other mode of transmission, uh, like nematodes or uh, thrips. So there are so many, um, for different viruses, there are different modes of transmissions. Even in the mode of transmission, how fast a particular virus can be spread in a, in a given location. So for all these uh, things, uh, diagnostics is, is very important. The more you know about the virus, the more you know um, with an established diagnostic protocol with high confidence, you would be able to study all these all this, uh, uh, virus issues. And then spatial temporal disease. Uh, spatial temporal just talks about the space and the time uh, of a given virus disease. For example, um, you have a, a leaf roll virus or a, or a, a grape and red box virus. Uh, how in a given uh, vineyard, uh, how much it can spread per season, or you know how fast it can spread. What is the rate of transmission? Uh, for those kind of uh, those kind of studies, also diagnostics are very important. So I don't need to mention again about the plant protection and quarantine, how the diagnostic labs are evolved, especially on the plant side. Uh, either it is a provincial diagnostics lab, federal diagnostics lab, or even international diagnostics lab. Uh, like EPPO that we have to regulate or, or quarantine the disease, um, virus diseases, uh, especially to protect them not to spread between the countries or be between the provinces. And then disease management and mitigation also a very important aspect of diagnostics. When you have a very established diagnostic protocol, especially for large scale detection, when you're looking especially at the perennial crops, where plants are propagated through planting material, uh, the need of high uh, impactful uh, large-scale diagnostics plays a very important role in disease management. So again, uh, my apologies for a lot of text in the slide, uh, but um, all I wanted to say is, uh, especially when it comes to the grapevine production systems, uh, especially the sustainability of grapevine production system depends heavily on the plant, state, plant health, uh, especially because we are propagating through uh, planting material in places like Canada, where we do use uh, grafted planting material, which again improves our chances of getting infected because we use the 
a rootstock and a scion, two different materials uh, to establish a, a propagative material. And then repo and virus, uh, we all know that it is, it, they cause significant economic losses. Although there are many viruses that can infect points, there are few that can cause economic losses, um, especially the impact, the yield and the quality of the, of the, of the vine. The negative of the grape wine diseases uh, also affects the rooting ability, graft intake, wine vigor, and the very qualities have been demonstrated across the uh, different geographical region, climatic regions. The disease diagnostics uh, have become extremely important for the effective management of the virus uh, spread and the mitigation practices. So that being said, I have two case studies here. Uh, one that is uh, RNA virus um, in the family cluster building, and then another, vi another virus is a DNA virus in the family Germany building, red wine red blotch virus. As you can see here, this is the, um, the classification of the family cluster building. I think it's a bit old, but there is another genus that is recently added. I should have updated my slide here. Um, the red, uh, the species that are highlighted in red, are actually the type species of, in each genus. Uh, there are three genuses, as you can see here, ampillovirus, virus, and trini virus. And the grape wine leaf roll associated with three, the beet yellow virus, and tomato chlorosis virus. So we're going to talk about um, tomato chlorosis virus, which is an emerging disease. Uh, just to give a, a perspective uh, on how this disease uh, progressing in recent years. And also, I would like to emphasize the fact that, you know, although these viruses are virtuous filamentous particles across all these genus, all the species, but they are transmitted by different insect species. For example, most of the ampelloviruses, except the leaf hole 2, uh, sorry, um, that's the, um, my apologies, it's the leaf hole 2, here in cluster viruses, most of these viruses are transmitted by either mealybugs or soft scale insects. The cluster viruses, for example, except leaf hole 2, are transmitted by aphid species, different, different viruses and different type of aphid species again. And then the trinity viruses are transmitted by white flies. As you can see, as the name of the virus, uh, the species name of the virus suggests, there are different crops that we are looking in the same family. Uh, they are from grapes to you know, beets, citrus, and tomatoes. So they're completely different uh, uh, type of uh, plants belongs to different families. When you look at the genome complexity, especially it is very important in terms of diagnostics, uh, you know, most of the people ask me, okay, this, this is the grape wine viruses, there are so many different type of grape wine viruses and you're calling them as grape wine leaf roll associated virus one to probably 10. Um, and why don't you test all at a time with one single test? So this is, this is the answer. So you see the genome complexity, they are different. Maybe one or two viruses based on their conserved uh, region in the genome, we can design some sequence primers uh, that can able to detect this, both viruses at the same time, but mixing more than two uh, is obviously it's very critical, very difficult uh, because of their genomic variations. As you can see the phylogenetic tree here, it's more updated. There is a one more species, uh, genus here, a little virus, I believe from the seven in it. Um, and you can see they are different. Um, the phylogenetic evolution is different uh, based on their genome. Now it is, makes more sense for me to understand the, the, the phylogeny, phylogeny, how the classification actually uh, uh, displayed here. So when you look at this, especially at the tomato chlorosis virus, uh, this virus in around the 1995-96 is first been reported in, in the USA. Um, it's a white fly transmitted uh, virus, as, as I just mentioned. As you can see, uh, from 1996 to 2008, the number of countries that is that has been that it has been uh, being reported, um, the 35 countries so far. So. It also makes me wonder uh, how this virus is, uh, you know, spreading in terms of uh, its vector biology, 
as I mentioned, it's a white fly transmitted viruses. Our general belief is that this white fly is present in tropical countries. They're more problematic in the solanaceous crops. Um, that is very understandable if we see that virus in places like Florida or Mexico uh, or India. Uh, but recently, the virus has been reported in places like Netherlands. So, and also it goes on to say that the climatic changes um, is also playing an important role here in terms of how it is influencing the insect vectors. We thought to believe that there is only one insect vector, the white fly, one species, but recently they found out that uh, the, there is another white fly species that are more uh, adjusted to the greenhouse conditions uh, than the, the outside conditions. That's why it is very difficult to control, especially in the places like Netherlands where they grow a lot of vegetables under the greenhouses. So uh, coming back to the, the grape again, um, with the example of uh, grape mite red grass virus, uh, I think before going to that, I just wanted to um, make sure that you, the difference between the leaf roll and the grape mite red grass virus, the leaf roll, the particles are different and the Gemini viruses are supposed to be a geminate particles. We haven't had that picture yet. The genetic material is RNA for leaf roll viruses whereas for the grape and grape blast virus is DNA. The linear single-stranded genome for grape and leaf roll virus, circular single-stranded DNA for grape and grape blast virus. So again, don't uh, worry about you know, following all those uh, patterns here. Uh, what, what all I wanted to say here is, when you look at the Germany virus evolution, especially the species under the Germany Bill Day, uh, Probably 10 years back, we only know there are only three or four different species, uh, genus in the family Gemini Wilde. But I think today it's more than nine uh, genus and different species in there. So with the advancement of technology like uh, next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing, the more we are digging in, the more we are finding. And the more crops we are, we are exploring that these viruses are infected with. And also, the traditional uh, virology books always says there are viruses that belong to these three uh, uh, genera here. They're called the world, world, world Germany viruses. And then all the ones down here are the new world Germany viruses. That being said, I just read an article a couple of days back that a bipartite Germany virus has been reported on great points. So I don't know what. How it happened. So when you look at the geographical distribution of grapevine red blotch virus, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, as you can see, most of the reports are coming from um, northern hemisphere here, especially Mexico, US, and parts of Canada. And the recent report from India, uh, especially on the table grapes where they reported grapevine red blotch virus, the interesting thing about that, that report is it is the same sequence that we saw here in, in North America, but it doesn't show any symptoms. So it's something whether climatic conditions are playing a role there. So one more question I've been frequently asked by many uh, grape growers, especially our fruit growers, that you know when we are referring, there are so many virus infections in grapes or in other fruit crops that are usually commonly grown side by side in, in places like Niagara or Okanagan Valley, especially in Canadian conditions. Uh, what are the viruses? Is there any mixed infections that are, that are like cross infections that are going on with the same virus, with the same insect vector that can be problematic? But as you can see in this Venn diagram here, uh, kind of summarized why grapes are more sensitive because the numbers represents the number of viruses that have been reported in each species each uh, type of uh, crop here, the grape wines with a maximum of uh, close to 90 when you, when you mix all these three here, and then palm fruit and stone fruit, um, just to um, um, make it clear if, if somebody is not understanding what is foam and what is stone. Uh, the palm fruits are very soft, uh, fleshy, the small seeds, especially like the apples and pears, and the stone fruits are the ones that uh, with um, uh, very hard, mostly one uh, seed with the stone-like structure. 
uh, like cherries and uh, plums and, and apricots. Uh, as you can see, they don't share the viruses, they don't share, share the space. Uh, basically, a very small number of viruses that can be uh, co-infections between these groups. And that's probably why we don't see that kind of a virus movement when you have an apple orchard or grape, uh, grape wine, uh, grape vineyard side by side. Um, and also, I, I don't see, although maybe one or two exceptions, the insect vectors are also very confined to their uh, their own uh, species, uh, type species here. Um, that being said, uh, the grape wines are most susceptible to many viruses. So how do you detect the viruses? Um, so as you see in this uh, flow diagram here, I have four type of uh, virus diagnostics. Uh, one is the symptom based, and then the biological indexing, uh, serological based detection techniques, and molecular. So we'll go one, uh, one by one um, in, in detail, but basically what I'm trying to say is the symptom base, uh, we can see uh, kind of clues that we can get based on symptoms, what type of virus or the infection or pathogen it would be, but most of the time it is non-specific. And biological indexing, uh, we'll go through this again, but it's, uh, um, it's more of a, a symptom based, but labor intensive and time consuming uh, process. You need a lot of expertise. I have a few slides on that as well. And then the serological and molecular are more reliable uh, and mostly used in the, the certification program or quarantine programs. So that being said, um, the type of sample is very important when you are looking at, when you are, um, you know, deciding which diagnostic that test that you're using. Uh, especially that is true for grapevines because it's one, it's one of the well-established uh, diagnostic um, uh, procedures for the grapevine in, in all the food crops. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm kind of giving you as a model here uh, because most of these grapevine viruses are limited to phloem tissue. So that's why it's very important what, when we are selecting the, the leaf material for virus testing. And again, which, te which, which type of testing that you wanted to see. So in this circle, as you can see, the ones highlighted in green are the ones that are best suited for the samples uh, for virus testing. For example, I wanted to highlight one particular uh, thing here in the May, early or late spring, and the grapevine family virus and grapevine pinot B virus are uh, reported to be present in high concentrations and slowly the virus concentrations goes down. We don't know the mechanism behind it, how these viruses behave like that, but that's the best time to, if you are looking for one of these two viruses, to go and collect the leaf samples and test uh, with, a, with a particular method. For all, uh, for the viruses like leaf roll and red blotch, um, it is uh, recommended to, you know, go somewhere between uh, late July uh, or until the, the leaves becomes senescence and drops down. Um, the leaf material, collecting leaf material at that time is, uh, is recommended just because the virus uh, is believed to be moving from roots to the uh, upper canopy and the virus titer slowly increases as the temperature rises as the canopy grow, uh, growth increases. And especially it is very important to collect the mature leaves at the lower part of the canopies because of the virus titer is present in high concentrations there. So that being said, we can detect the viruses using cane samples. Um, again, the protocols as mentioned here, uh, we just want one or two, uh, six to eight, uh, six to 10 inches in size, just to get the prime tissue out of them. And I just highlighted in the gray here because most of the time in Ontario or even DC conditions, that we, we don't have enough material to test for the virus yet. Virus is here in commercial conditions, but uh, if we have, if you still want to test even a little bit of, you know, a sample is enough uh, to get the virus tested. So uh, looking back again at the symptom-based detection, uh, you might have seen these pictures um, so many times, but. It all depends on which cultivar that you're using, how much virus present, which type of virus present, and uh, what is the timing in the season. 
based on that, you might have a very good clues um, or sometimes you know confirmation based on just symptoms. But uh, that being said, there are so many other possible factors that can confuse, like nutrition deficiency, other physical um, damages that kind of mimics like uh, the virus symptoms that you are seeing here. So going back to the coming back to the, the ELISAs and the serological based detection techniques, uh, there are there have been some methods, uh, especially for lethal viruses, virus three, uh, lethal virus one, uh, very established uh, protocols, ELISA based protocols because their antibodies are strong. Um, when you, take, when you look at advantage, um, we need less technical knowledge and uh, large scale detections are possible uh, with ELISAs. Uh, the, the limitations. The limitations are um, the extraction of large number of samples in the short time because we need to be grinding samples, getting the extractions out. Uh, if you want to plan for large scale, that's one of the limitations there. But with the, with the kind of our technologies that we have using semi automatic um, grinding units, homozygizers, uh, that can be um, uh, overcome. Uh, the antibodies is one of the major limitations because you see the list of viruses that infects grapes here, we don't have antibodies for. Um, so, sorry. These are the viruses that have only uh, antibodies are available, the rest, uh, uh, the rest of the viruses, we don't have antibodies. And, um, you know, sometimes we do see based on the type of epitope of the antibodies that is produced based on uh, the, there is non specific or the limit of detection is low. Uh, and then when you produce an antibody for one particular strain of viruses, uh, because of the nature of the virus in the natural conditions, it can mutate and form a different variant. You, there is a high chance that you miss these variants if you are just doing the ELISA based detection techniques. So, moving back to the PCR, uh, polymer exchange reaction as it stands for, where we are actually looking into the part of viral genome, trying to amplify that into millions and millions of read, where you can load that product in an agarose gel to see um, using a, a, a dye, you can see the band of that particular amplicon. As, as shown in this picture here. Uh, and then again, it is an endpoint PCR. Most of this uh, will, will tell you whether the virus is present or absent. And the second type of PCR-based methods are quantitative PCRs, whether it is a cyber green based uh, qPCR or a droplet, droplet digital PCR. Uh, they exactly tell you in a given sample how much virus is there, or what is the titer of the virus. So this is an example of you know, uh, a duplex um, reverse transcriptase quantitative PCR. As you can see, um, basically uh, the protocol says that you know, if you have a plant or insect tissues, we have to extract the nucleic acids and make cDNA, uh, cDNA and then using the a specific primers for particular viruses, you can uh, amplify it using the real-time qPCR and then with the melt curve analysis, as you can see in these pictures here, you can detect two viruses in one sample. Uh, that's how it is standardized. Um, that being said, it will give you a relative quantification of uh, the viral titer uh, in a given sample. When you compare that with the uh, droplet digital PCR, which gives you absolute quantification of a, of a given viral DNA or RNA in a given sample, as you can see here, we recently published a uh, detection of the droplet digital PCR, say for grape and red dot virus, uh, for different uh, samples. This is a picture of each droplet here will tell you, a represents a copy of viral genome, uh, which, can, which can be quantified here using these droplets. And the, the agarosal electrophores is using endpoint PCR as mentioned here for the same set of samples where you can see comparatively, here we only see the band that is present or absent. Here we can see how much virus is present. So going forward, uh, there are later flow immunoassays as well as uh, a new plasmonic CRISPR-Cas12A assay that we recently developed 
in collaboration with the Department of Chemistry here, which is published in Analytical Chemistry. As you can see here, um, it is a PCR-based assay, but using a different approach to visualize the end product, the PCR product. As you can see in the figure A here, uh, from infected or uh, infected plant, you have a sample collection and preparation. It's basically extracting nutric acids. And using the plasmonic CRISPR-Cas12 ASA, you can visualize the color of the PCR products. Whether it is, it will, it will be red if it is, the target is present, if it is not, it will be in blue. So how it happens, the CRISPR, as uh, reported by many uh, high-reviewed publications, in the presence of Cas12 protein, it has a single-standard DNA's activity. So what it forms is the substrate, single-standard DNA substrate here, which is also acts as a linker between the, these two molecules here. If you have a, a plasmonic gold nanoparticles, um, in the presence of linker molecule, as you can see, they, they bind together and uh, because of the density they have, uh, they change the color into purple. Whereas in the presence of a target viral DNA, or viral RNA, it won't be coupling together and they stay as well. So that's the basis of this color development using the plasmonic uh, gold nanoparticles. As you can see very clearly here, how it can be, we can see in the real um, uh, PCR reactions from the infected plants, you can see the red color, which is again we quantified using the, the absorbance. Uh, if you see this picture here, it's very clear that we can clearly differentiate between these purple and red uh, colors using the absorbance values. So, and also this uh, linker molecule is independent of the target, uh, target sequence, we can use the same um, linker molecules for different type of targets. For example, if you want to uh, look into different uh, viruses, you can use the same targets. So, although it is a PCR-based um, detection assay, the level of sensitivity it can almost goes to automolar concentration. So that's where the limitation is, especially when you have situations where the virus titers are low uh, or viruses are present in the latent conditions with very low titers. Um, some of these techniques will come uh, handy when you're detecting the virus. So putting this together, um, conventional PCRs, real-time PCR, digital PCR, you can all detect, uh, but the quantitativeness is the difference. The conventional PCR is a semi-quantitative. The real-time PCR, either it is a cyberbean or a, um, a probe-based PCR, uh, it's a relative quantification, and the digital PCR is an absolute quantification. There are so many advantages with all the uh, three different techniques, but most importantly, uh, the time, uh, how much is the downstream applications, with the conventional PCRs, you can go for sequencing and then study further evolutionary analysis. With the real-time PCRs, you can still have those options, but uh, the time uh, is probably less. And then you can also do a bit of multiplexing using the multi-carbon analysis. And uh, digital PCR, uh, the post-PCR processing, there is no post-PCR -process processing. Um, very sensitive when you compare to other type of PCR reactions. And then again, um, limitations are always depend on what exactly you are looking, what is your application is. Um, the conventional PCRs are all at the size-based PCR. There is a post-PCR processing. After you've done the PCR, you have to run a gel to confirm it. And then in the real-time PCRs, uh, especially when you are looking relative quantification of one particular gene to other, you need a reference gene. Uh, and um, there is the chances of non-specific bindings, especially with the cyberbean where it is dependent only on the double standard DNA binding nature. And then we need a lot of optimization, a lot of expertise to understand the genomic nature of the target that you are looking. And uh, the multiplexing will also need a lot of skills. Uh, the same goes to the digital PCR, uh, how much you can do for large scale. Uh, definitely you cannot be looking at a large amplicon with a, a digital PCR. And definitely we need a lot of uh, uh, 
the knowledge and skills about particular uh, target that you are working on. So that brings us to the last one, the high throughput sequencing. Um, it's relatively new, uh, but still, um, when you compare 10, 10 years back, the amount of the, uh, the price to do the HDS is coming down very drastically. Uh, so basically four uh, steps here. I have another slide explaining that in detail, uh, especially when you are looking at the virus, whether you are looking at the total RNA, total nucleic acid, double standard RNA, or small single standard RNA, and then going to the cDNA libraries, running them on a, a HDS uh, machine, the data analysis, the virus discovery, whether you want to assemble the genomes, that is a big part in the HDS. So putting these two all, all together, we have a virus infected plant. There are four different options uh, to start with. Either you uh, go with the total RNA, because imagining that in the total RNA, you have viral RNAs as well. And the total nucleic acids, you have viral RNA and DNA as well. And then small RNAs, just because of the fact that uh, one of the only known defense mechanism in plants in response to any pathogen, especially viruses, is the RNA IE pathway, where uh, the target new RNA of a virus is recognized by certain proteins and it would be choked down what we call the small RNAs, which is the indication of the presence of uh, an infection. So when we isolate this small RNAs and sequence them, we might end up getting the whole genome of a particular virus or viruses. And then you can enrich these important nucleic acids um, through either using the nucleic acid probes or you know, specifically double stand RNA uh, because it is considered as an RNA intermediate uh, for most of the plant viruses in their replication as well as in their biogenesis. So if you have, have double standard RNA isolated and then process uh, through for uh, next generation sequencing, the amount of viral enrichment is huge when you compare to other methods. So the simply, uh, when you get the end use sequence in the read, the, there is a quality check, the adapter sequence will be filtered, and then we have a lot of biomimetic analysis in terms of uh, how to assemble those sequences and then using the available, publicly available genome databases whether you compare your sequences with the existing databases, or you can develop your own database using the plant virus database from the, all the publicly available in, uh, database, and then blast against that, and then recover your sequences, what exactly the viruses that you have. And then once you have that information, you can assemble uh, these viruses, uh, and then tell whether you have a whole genome or how much of the whole genome, what is the coverage, and then based on that, you can, uh, you can name the virus, you can completely characterize the virus. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight is, uh, especially when you're looking at the, uh, the viruses that infect fruit crops, the wind tool is developed at, uh, uh, by Mike Watts lab at the Canadian Food, in Food Inspection Agencies, is the tool that uh, specifically makes it easier of all these processes that you have to go, go through once you have the large amount of data uh, from the HTS reads. Um, this tool actually does, does everything for you and uh, gives you a summary of what viruses you have. So basically tools like this will, will be very critical when you are looking at a large data sets and the large scale uh, diagnostics based on the high throughput sequencing. So putting together everything, um, what are the applications that we have? So we talked about the visual, we talked about the biological, serological, PCR and the HTS. Uh, HQP, highly qualified personnel. The visual, probably um, you need a little bit of uh, experience, but you know, um, basically you don't need that much expertise. Uh, don't need that much data uh, for that. A um, little bit of imagine, imagination is needed. Sometimes it's not good. Um, time is very, very less. You can, once you see, I think you can remember that. The applications, the field based in greenhouses, you can, once you saw in a particular disease in a particular uh, host, I think you can, you'll have a, a better idea of what you're exactly are looking at. When it comes to the biological, I would say you need really technical expertise because 
the skills that, that need it, either it's the grafting or mechanical transmission. Uh, you need to understand what that particular is. You need to understand the mode of uh, the method that you are you are looking uh, when you are wanting to replicate the same symptoms using the biological methods. Whether it's a grafting, which is just proving that you have infected plants, you have a healthy plant. You are taking a, a, a sample from here and dropping on this one and making sure the same symptoms appear. That's called biological indexing. Um, definitely, you need a, a bit of equipment for that. But the time that it takes is the one that 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 is that limits this particular method uh, because some of the viruses when you're looking at when you're working on perennial crops where you have only one uh, one season in a year you might be looking at a couple of years to get the symptoms on a particular virus so again a lot of applications in terms of field based greenhouse based research and a uh, lot of research uh, basic research as well as you know, a lot of certification programs still believe that this is a gold standard uh, for particular viruses. So in terms of um, serological, we have uh, ELISAs, we have lateral uh, immunofluorescence assays, where do, we do need a bit of uh, high, highly qualified um, personal and experience. Now for ELISAs, especially, you need a lot of equipment, um, the ELISA readers, the ELISA plates, and the methods that you do, it takes a bit of time as well. And for the lateral immunoassay, you don't need that much because it mostly is a, it's a, like a strip test uh, where the antibodies and the conjugates are, are binded in one uh, filter paper where you dip that filter paper in a, in a sample, a grinded sample, a plant sap that has a virus, and then it will show you um, just like a pregnancy test, I, I guess. Uh, whether it will show you whether the virus is present or not. Or not. So the applications are there, whether in the research, uh, the, uh, the field, especially commercial diagnostic uh, sheets that are available uh, that are very useful you know, when you have uh, lateral immuno, immunoassay strips that are available for a quick check, I would say. And the PCRs, definitely um, QPCR is an endpoint PCR. You need highly skilled people. And the equipment is a fairly bit expensive in terms of PCRs, extracting nucleic acids, and then analyzing them in different methods. So the time I would say for both methods would probably take the same time, uh, but the applications are, uh, are, are huge in terms of field-based research, greenhouse research, basic research, a lot of certification programs. They use both endpoint and few PCRs as their standards in their certification programs. The high of sequencing definitely more than what, what all other methods require. Uh, the equipment is also expensive, but it's also uh, coming down very drastically because of the lot of applications and the uses. And the usage has been increasing. And the time uh, should be little more, but if you have tools like the tool that I just explained, this is what we are going to cut down. If you cut down the time, everything, uh, the whole price point will come down. And then the applications, I would say, we are not there at the certification level, but a lot of international organizations, a lot of national clean plan programs from different countries are actually looking for an universal uh, method of uh, high throughput sequencing to include that in the certification program, which, is, which will be an advantage uh, for a lot of reasons uh, to move the plan, same plants in different countries. For example, if they have a universal system, you don't have to go through each quarantine step, which takes a lot of time and efforts, uh, probably increases the cost of the planting material as well. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the research fundings that I have uh, for, the, for, for my lab and a uh, lot of educational resources there. And uh, my, contact, my contact, if anybody wants more, more questions or anything, I would uh, like to leave with this slide here, which kind of gives you a perspective of uh, how much we know about the virus genomes. If we put together, it will be a length of 250 million light years. But um, so so far, so much we know, but it's so little. There's so much to explore. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much for 
So on the one year old grade line, so the plan for the last year, is there a way to test it? I would still say yes, um, for two reasons. Um, it is believed, well, the question is, the one year old grade point is a grafted grade point, whether in the first year of their growth, whether it is still reliable to test. Um, yes or no? First, no, because if the virus is present in the rootstock, we have seen the virus, have, if the cyan is free and the virus is present in, only in the rootstock, to move the virus from rootstock to cyan, it might take a year, two or three sometimes. So that's why, you know, yes, because when the virus is present on the cyan, we can see it in the first year. And again, it depends on how much is the virus tighter in it. But if you have the methods like quantitative PCR or high throughput sequence of PCR that I just explained, we can detect even in the minute quantities. So just to further comment to that, that uh, with the, the amount of time that it would take for virus uh, to transmit up to the scion if it was in the rootstock, that further emphasizes the need that we all know we need uh, a clean plant program for mm -hmm. Canada that's testing not just the scion, but the rootstock material as well, right? Yeah, I agree. Um, so could you just uh, explain to the group, I know you've talked a lot about high throughput sequencing and, you know, the increased sensitivity and the broad array of viruses, you know, that, that we could pick up with that technology and that the cost is, is coming down. Um, but could you also speak to the value of that if a new virus were to occur? Yeah, I missed the point. Um, the value of uh, HTS is huge because uh, uh, it's just not only pulls out everything, every virus that is there, every viral nucleic acid that is there in a, in a given sample, but it also uh, allows us to explore if there is a new virus disease, an emerging disease, emerging virus disease perhaps. Uh, that's one of the unique uh, advantages using the next generation sequencing. It kind of gives you uh, an overall picture of viral. The, the total bio, the biome of the, um, the virus. Uh, whether it is any type of viruses, we can pull out everything. We don't need to do individual tests for each and every virus to confirm it. So right now, um, our testing is based on knowing the viruses, you know, that are, are could potentially infect grapevine, but we know that these things evolve over time. So. NGS or HTS technology would allow us to have that snapshot early on, right? right? If something new and, um, is emerging so that we don't have to wait for years to come to realize that we've got another problem on our hands and we know that. Right, yeah, right. I agree. Um, and could you just comment uh, to the group on, uh, on our current status uh, in Kagi? Do we have some of this technology available um, uh, that we're working with, you know, what's available currently for diagnostic testing and areas that we're working on for the future so that we're, you know, at that cutting edge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Kavi Diagnostic Lab started in um, 2018, early 2018, um, trying to establish into a national laboratory, uh, a service provider as well as not only for the growers, nurseries for the researchers across the Canada. Um, so we, uh, right now we are, we have an established laboratory that provides uh, uh, molecular diagnostics, especially PCR based diagnostics for a number of grape point viruses, not just uh, the list that you see on our website, but uh, we do have capacity to increase that to many number of viruses. Uh, we basically right now we currently offer PCR based diagnostics. That being said, uh, uh, we have state-of-art facilities um, for uh, digital drop the digital PCR, a quantitative PCR, as well as uh, with the new uh, Pendev uh, funding, uh, we are successful in procuring uh, high throughput sequencing equipment. Right now, we are in the standardization of so many uh, the metrics uh, for uh, HTS-based uh, virus diagnostics, and uh, hopefully, it will be available um, on the website very soon. 
Are there any other questions? Sorry, can I just go yeah. back to that one year old lot? So, when's the earliest it makes sense to take the sample? Uh, even if it is a one year old plant, I would still suggest to collect the samples. Uh, if we are looking at the leaf samples, probably end of July to anywhere between like end of November, before the leaves start to yellow, becomes an essence and uh, all out. If, if you are looking especially at the leaf material, and if you want to just test any time, the cane sample is fine any time of the year. Like there's enough wood there. Yeah, it, it just you have enough, enough wood there. But uh, if it is just one sample, I would, you can still work with the small size of the cane. Uh, only thing is, if you have a, um, if you have one year old and you have only one shoe that is coming out, you don't want to cut them out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the testing which you're currently offering, Greg Burroughs now, is all of the quality that could detect Yes, um, the, our protocols mainly based on based are equal to the the standard uh, protocol 2010 that um, uh, FPS uh, Foundation Plant Services uses. We use the same primers that they use. Um, so it's basically endpoint PCR uh, with high sensitivity. If there's no other questions, I'm, oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, when people call and ask, does every virus cause a disease in grapevine? I would say no. <laughs> and this is something a complex uh, situation where you have um, a particular virus or a species of virus that is associated with the symptoms, and then you can, if you have isolated that particular virus in a pure form, and then put it on a new plant, a healthy plant, and then produce the same type of symptoms. That I call the pathogen with the crude post postulates. And that is probably, I would associate it with the disease as well. But there are so many latent viruses, uh, or, or viruses that doesn't show any kind of symptoms. Uh, so I would say those are not diseases. Uh, the, the viruses that are present in latent, latent infections are um, not necessarily a, a disease. With follow-up, does MGS detect any viruses present, but not all of those viruses cause symptoms? MGS can pull up everything. Uh, which what I mean is either it is a, a virus that causes symptoms or associated with the symptoms or a virus that is present in the latent infections. NGS pulls out every um, possible virus like nucleic acids in a given sample. Okay, well, please join me in thanking uh, Sid for a wonderful uh, presentation. We have and our lecture series will uh, continue next week. Uh, with Covey's senior viticulturist, uh, Jim Wilworth, and Jim's talk is entitled A Decade of Freezing Buds and Blankets, The Trials and Tribulations of Cold Hardiness and Freeze Protection Research. So that will be on March 16th at 2 p.m., so we hope you can all join us again. Thanks.